So we did, uh, we were part of a project at the Mount Pleasant campus yesterday, and we packaged 60,000 meals that are going to be sent to Sri Lanka uh, to people who need them, which was so much fun, uh, su such an honor to do that and be a part of it. But it was like, a, it reminded me of my restaurant days. You know, I was a food runner, and so I was running buckets of rice and beans to people who were packing them. And at one point, I came around a corner. I was carrying rice, and there was another dude running around with a, a thing of beans, and we ran into each other and nearly made a huge mess. Uh, but, but it reminded me of my days working at Outback Steakhouse, moment of silence, Outback closed in Mount Pleasant this weekend. But uh, Lisa and I, Actually, it's because it wasn't very good anymore. I mean, let's be honest. Um, but when we started, it was awesome. It was the best restaurant in town. Uh, I was a server there. Lisa was a hostess. And uh, we opened the restaurant back in the late 90s. And uh, there'd be like an hour, hour and a half wait. It was crazy at Outback Steakhouse. And, and, and as we got into it, it was so busy. We, we learned how to carry these trays. Have you guys seen these guys? Uh, I'd never done it before. And so when you're a rookie you put it on your shoulder because it's kind of a, but then you get good at it and you're just kind of walking around. I got you. I got you. It's a tray full of food and drinks and all of this stuff. Uh, but uh, what would happen is it was so busy and it was so crazy. There were two problem areas in the restaurant, two corners that if, if you didn't let people know you were coming, and this happened almost nightly early on is you'd come flying around the corner with a tray, somebody else is flying around the corner, and boom, what happens, right? This whole tray falls over, all of the blooming onion on the floor, and there's sauce and drinks and all of this stuff, and, and nobody wants to be that server. You hear the loud noise, and everybody's looking. I thought about dropping this one for you, but Adam did that last week with the Stanley, so I'm not going to do it. But, but it, you'd have this mess that you'd have to clean up, and so so we learned over the first few months of the restaurant that we had to solve this problem. Like these areas of problem were predictable. We knew if there was going to be a collision, we knew where it was going to happen. And so we learned how to solve it. And so what we do is anytime you were approaching that corner, you would yell, corner, right? Just corner. And what you're doing is you're letting whoever's on the other side of that corner know, hey, I'm coming. And then you'd learn how to navigate the corner as well and get the food, get the blooming onion to the poor people that need it, right? Why do I talk to you about that today? Did you know that um, our lives have some pretty predictable corners in them? There's some areas, problem areas, that if we don't navigate them well, we will end up cleaning up messes in our life. Uh, it's areas of temptation areas and and my areas of temptation may not be the same as your areas of temptation but we all have temptation in our life these these areas that the enemy of your soul the enemy of God's plans for your life would love to see you trip up and drop the tray and 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 stall you from entering into God's promises and today we're going to talk about temptation how do we overcome temptation and if you are um New here, we've got an app, Seacoast app. We'll have all of our notes there. But, but we all have temptation, these areas that are problems. See, I don't know anybody, I've never met a person in my life that said, you know what, on January 1st, I've got a goal this year. I'm going to gain 50 pounds. I want to I test out diabetes. That would be cool. I've heard about it. I'm, this year, I'm going after it, right? No, nobody starts a year that way. But then there are these, these problem areas, and we, we make sacrifices, and then we end up like me, I wanted to lose 15 pounds. I've got 20 pounds to go. So praise God, we're on the right track because <laughs> of these, these problem areas, right? I don't know anybody who's like, hey, five-year plan, bankruptcy. It's going to be great. I, I want to go to prison. You know, I want to blow up my marriage this year. I wanna, no, nobody. I, I want to be an alcoholic. That would be cool. I just want to get addicted. No, I know a lot of people who like to drink. I don't know anybody who said, you know what, I want to become addicted to a substance, but, but we've got these corners, these problem areas, and if we don't navigate them wisely, again, the enemy of our soul would love to make a mess. Here's what I want to say to you. Some of you are in the middle of the mess, like you're, you're on the other side of a really bad decision, and you're in the middle of the mess. That's why we need the gospel. 
That's why we need Jesus. Jesus is here to help us. He Actually, he knew we would not be able to do this. He knew we would mess up our lives in some area. And so this is a safe place. The church is a safe place. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But today I'm talking to those of us who are thinking about making a mess. And so I, just, I, I say that because the enemy might... You might hear judgment or what, it's not, not from the Lord, okay? Like we, we love getting involved in the messiness of people's lives and helping to see God restore and redeem and bring grace because that's what he does. But, but, but life works so much easier when we don't drop the tray, when we don't make a mess of our lives. And so we're gonna look at Joseph and we've been in this series and uh, Joel talked about favor and I believe the story of Joseph's life, it, it, it mirrors all of our lives to some degree in the sense that God has given you a vision. He's given you a dream. He's put gifts inside of you. He has a purpose for you. And, and we have to learn how to navigate some of these tests and trials that build our character, that help us live out the mission that he has for us. Joel talked about the, the favor test and, and Joseph failed it, right? He, he, he did not do well with the pride test early on, but then he learned how to navigate that better as he got older. Last week, Adam did a beautiful job of talking about the adversity test, and we all have to learn how to navigate adversity in our lives, and today, we're going to zoom in on Genesis chapter 39, where Joseph dealt with the temptation test. He shows us how he navigated temptation, and what I love about it is that often when we talk about temptation, we go to Samson, or we go to David, and we look at people who messed up their life with temptation. Joseph actually passed the test. And so let's see if we can figure out what did he do? How did he navigate it in a way that could save us from dropping the tray at some of those corners in our life? And so we're going to read the story together. Uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's Genesis chapter 39, and um, we'll, we'll start with verse 1. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything that he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. By the way, not preaching on this today, but if you're a follower of Christ, you should be a blessing in your place of work. <laughs> we should be the kind of people that, man, we bring the presence of God with us. We bring blessing and that your supervisor, or your boss is like, man, I am, my life is better because this person works here. And that's what happened in Joseph, Joseph's life. And it says that all of his household affairs ran smoothly. His crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except for what kind of food to eat. Some of y'all are, you own a business. You know what it's like. You've had Joseph's working for you. You know, people who you can just trust that, man, they're gonna own it. They're gonna do, pour their heart and soul into it. And it, it's amazing when, when you have that. Lisa says that, I remind her a lot of Joseph in the Bible, and I think it's because of this next passage. It says, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. <laughs> this, is where, this is where temptation comes in. And I would just say this, oftentimes we are most tempted in areas that God has gifted us in our life. Because why? Because temptation comes from the enemy, and he wants to usurp and take us down, often in the areas that we're gifted. And here's what happened with him says that Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his household. No one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me except for you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It'd be a great sin against God. She keeps putting pressure on Joseph day after day but he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. Very common tactic of the enemy, by the way. He wants to get, isolate you, get you alone. No one else is around. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, 
but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran out of outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She had the evidence, right? Falsely accused. She kept that cloak with her until her husband came home. And then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave that you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Verse 19, Potiphar was furious when he heard this, his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and he threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. We'll pick up the story in just a minute. But, but that's the story of Joseph. He's already gone through all of this adversity. Now God's blessed him. He's got favor on his life. He's moving in the direction of his dream. When all of a sudden he faces this incredible temptation, but he overcomes it. And here would be my synopsis of this passage. For every dream that you have in your life that God's given you, the enemy has a counterfeit fantasy for you. He's going to dangle some things that seem great, but they're not. They're, they're fantasies. They're counterfeits. And if you step into those fantasies, your dream will become a nightmare. I know it because we see it throughout Scripture. I know it because I've been, been able to, and again, I, I have the joy to walk people through the messes of their life. But if you've been through it, you know that the fantasy can quickly become a nightmare. I believe God has given all of us a dream. And it may not be this specific thing, but he has created you with purpose and a plan and direction. And we're going to learn today how to navigate those corners, navigate the, the fantasies that the enemy would throw into our way in, in a way that we continue to maintain our integrity and walk towards the plans that God has for us. What do we learn? I see four things in this that really stood out to me in overcoming temptation. Number one, prioritize God's presence. Joseph prioritized God's presence. It's interesting that the start of this, this chapter and the end of this chapter repeats the same phrase twice in the beginning and twice in the end. Verses three and four, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything that he did, and he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that what? The Lord was with Joseph. And then at the end, he gets falsely accused and Potiphar throws him in prison. And we would think, man, this is where, you know, the story kind of gets terrible. But the reality is in prison, it says the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. The Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything the Lord was with him and caused everything that he did to succeed. The Lord was with him. That's the main point of this passage, that God was with Joseph. God was with him when he was at the top of his game. He had the promotions. He had the money flowing in. He was doing well. And then at the end of the chapter, he's in prison. And the Lord was with him. And some, some of us get confused and we think that the blessing of God, the presence of God, the favor of God must mean that things are always going to go well for me. I'm always going to get the promotion. But, but sometimes the presence of God is the very thing that sustains us through the adversity that we're going to face. Joseph prioritized the presence of God. He recognized the presence of God. And the reason that I think this is so important is, is that, that if we approach overcoming temptation, or we approach navigating these corners of our life strictly from a don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, here are the rules, here are the, we're missing the point. That's what the Pharisees were kind of tempted into doing is just, I'm going to follow the rules and regulations of God without the presence of God, without the relationship with God. And if we don't prioritize God's presence, and I know you guys win today. All of you resisted the temptation to sleep in today and came to church here and at our campuses, even if you're watching online. And so, so you're here, I'm preaching to the choir, but we have to prioritize the presence of God. Don't just be running away from something, be running to someone. 
get in his presence. You can be tempted to skip church, skip small group, and it's just a subtle slope that we begin to, to move away from the presence of God. We can experience his presence every day in our home, spending time in his word and worship. You gotta develop this love for him, and it's gonna be a whole lot easier to do the next things that we talk about. You know, I've been married to Lisa. It'll be 23 years this coming summer, and, and we know that there are some things that we just don't do. When we got married, we just, you know, we're, there, there are some things we don't do. I'm not gonna go to lunch alone with somebody of the opposite sex. There are some things, some boundaries that we've put in place in our life, but those boundaries aren't gonna keep me from having an affair if I'm not pursuing my wife, right? If I'm not growing in my relationship with her. And so as much as we spend time on the, those things, we spend a whole lot more time having a date night every single week because we wanna grow in our love for each other. We spend a whole lot more time leaning into each other because it's when we lean away that problems start to surface in our marriage. And the same thing is true with God. So we're gonna, we're gonna resist temptation. It's gonna start by being more in love with Jesus tomorrow than I am today, by continuing to pursue that relationship with him, by continuing to stand in awe of the things that he's blessed us with and cultivate gratitude in our lives. We're gonna prioritize the presence of God. Second thing that we're gonna do that I see in the story is we're gonna magnify the cost. Magnify the cost of temptation. Look again, it says, but Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me. You know what? When the enemy tempts you, he usually is going, hey, you're missing out on something. There's something God doesn't want you to experience. But Joseph recognized, no, 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 I've been entrusted. I'm not entitled to, to, to this fantasy. I'm entrusted with a vision and a dream. And he's like, I, 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 I've been entrusted with all this. He says he hadn't held anything back except for you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. He magnified the consequences. He magnified the cost. Hey, this isn't just a little thing that nobody's gonna find out about. This would be sinning against God. This is wickedness. And, and, and the, the problem starts with us when we begin to minimize the, the consequences of sin. And here's what the enemy does. He's done it to me. He minimizes the consequences ahead of time, and then he maximizes them afterwards. Hey, it's not that big of a deal. It's just porn. Everybody does that. It's not a big deal. It's just a little bit of money that you're saving by withholding this information on your tax. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. And then once we step into sin, the enemy wants to pile on guilt, shame, and condemnation. Again, I'll say it again. I'm so thankful for the grace of Jesus. I would not be standing here if it weren't for it. So we need God's grace in our messes. But man, there's so much that we're carrying that it's just not worth dropping. We gotta magnify the cost. Remind yourself of what the cost would be. In Joseph's case, he's dealing with sexual temptation. I can think of at least three costs to that. It's gonna have a cost to your family. If, if you step into sexual sin, if I engage in sexual sin, it will have a cost to my family. Think about David. You know, David famously had this affair with Bathsheba. Did you know that four of David's sons ruined their lives because of sexual sin? What one generation does in moderation, often the next generation does in excess. And so don't minimize or trivialize the cost of, of our sexual temptations and what impact it's going to have on your family. I often rehearse some conversations. I often rehearse what would it feel like to sit down with my 16-year-old son and share the news with him that I had an affair. What, what would that do to him? What would that do to my 14-year-old daughter, my 10-year-old daughter, if I just had to sit down and go, hey, this, this is what your dad did. I try to imagine what that conversation would look like with Lisa when I have to look into her eyes and tell her that I violated the vows that I had promised her because I want to magnify the cost. I want to, I want to remember what it's going to cost. I want to remember what's at stake. I imagine standing on this platform and looking at each of you and having to share or confess that I've done something that's disqualified me from ministry and 
the impact of that can be devastating in churches. I try to imagine what that mess is going to look like when I'm tempted because I, I don't want to live it. And again, I've, I've had the, the privilege and the, the grace to be able to walk many families through it. And I know what those cries sound like. I know what it feels like to be completely devastated because of the consequences of our actions. Magnify the cost. There's a cost to your faith. I'm not saying that Jesus won't forgive you, but usually if you commit sexual sin, what do you do next? Lie, <laughs> deceive people, isolate. It always leads us to more and more and more, and it chips away at our faith. That's why Jesus prayed for Peter, not that he wouldn't sin, because I'm praying that your faith won't fail because he knows that the tendency is for us to isolate and have a cost to our faith. And I also know there's a cost to your future. There's a cost to your future. I, I love Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. And Solomon is a guy who knew sexual temptation and who failed in that area. Probably one of his biggest failures of his life. And so he writes these letters to his sons because he wants them to know what's at stake. And this is how he ends those three, letter, uh, th three chapters in uh, Proverbs 7. He says, listen to me, my sons. Pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray away toward her. Who is her? Sexual sin. Don't wander down her wayward path, for she has been the ruin of many. Many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. So the next time you hear that little voice that says, it's not a big deal. It's, it's, just, it's just everybody else's, no, the, the road leads to death. The wages of sin is death. It's why we need Jesus so much. It's why we need to repent from our sin and experience his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace, but magnify the cost. Where are you vulnerable in your life today? What would it look like for you to imagine and magnify the cost of our sin? So we're gonna prioritize God's presence. We're gonna magnify the cost and then we're gonna pre-decide our exit. Pre-decide. Any of you like me, when I walk into a new space, a large building, especially like this, the first thing that I do is look for the way out. <laughs> like what would I do if there was a fire? What would I do if there was an emergency? Where would I go? How do I get out? Sometimes I show up to your home for a Christmas party. I'm looking for the way out, uh, just in case, right? Uh, look for, uh, just looking for the way out. And here's what's amazing. If we prioritize God's presence, he promised us something about temptation, temptation. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians. He says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not, he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, notice he doesn't say if, all of us are gonna be tempted. He says, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. That's such a beautiful promise. Some people misinterpret that and they say, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not true. That's not biblical. Um, we're all gonna go through more than we can handle. Otherwise, we wouldn't need him, right? But, but what this promise is saying is say, specifically with temptation, he's always gonna give you a way out. And so what I try to do is, not look for the way out right when I'm in the middle of temptation, but to know myself well, to know the areas of vulnerability and to pre-decide my way out of those temptations. Why would I wait until I'm weak and vulnerable? I wanna make decisions when I'm feeling strong. They're gonna help me in the times that I'm feeling weak. Joseph knew his way out. So she kept putting pressure on him day after day. They finally get to this moment, right? One day, no one else is around. He, he went in to do his work. And she came and she grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on and sleep with me. And Joseph tore himself away, right? He tore himself away. He left his cloak in her hand and, and he lazily strolled. No, he didn't do that, did he? He ran from the house. He sprinted. You know, this cloak was a big deal in first century Israel. You knew a lot about somebody by their outer garment. It told you their status, it told you about their wealth, it told you a lot, but in that moment when she grabbed a hold of it, he took it off, right? And he took off and he ran because he cared more about his integrity than his coat, than what people thought about him. And hopefully the collar, collar fix, good, we're good. Thank you, thank you. But sometimes you have to just not care what it looks like, go, I'm, I'm taking off, I'm getting out of here. I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm gonna pre 
determine my exit strategy. You know, Lisa and I, when we got engaged, uh, we had an 18-month engagement. Don't recommend that if you're trying to do things the right way. Uh, we, we, had, we had a goal. Uh, we, we, we really did want to honor God with our sexual purity. We believe that the Bible actually means what it says, that we should flee from all sexual immorality, which would be sex outside of the context of marriage between a husband and a wife. And, and so we were in love with each other, and we, we, we were engaged, and we created some boundaries. These are some things that we know. These are lines that we don't want to cross uh, because we know that on the other side of those lines are sin. And so we created these boundaries, and then guess what we did next? We got as close to that line as we possibly could, <laughs> right? It's like, man, we just, you know, and, and what we realized is then we would step over that line, and then we'd feel guilty, and so we were just wrestling with this. And so nine months before we got married, we decided we got to move the line. We, we need to move the line. And so we moved the line, and we decided that for us, actually kissing was the gateway drug to everything else that we wanted to do. Uh, and it was like, man, we got to draw the line there. And so we decided nine months before we got married, we're going to stop kissing until we get married. Our friends all thought we were crazy. I thought we were crazy. My parents were even like, dude, really? Like, that's a little over the top, right? <laughs> but we knew that there would be these moments when we were feeling weak. And so we pre-decided that we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna prepare to not struggle there. And, and now we're married. And guess what? We still have vulnerabilities still have temptations. And so we've pre-decided some exit strategies. Uh, we, we've pre-decided that we've got uh, our phones, each of us have each other's, pa every password that I have, she's got. And I know what it feels like to have my wife grab my phone and be like, oh gosh. And I've shared some of my journey with you before. But now I know she's got every password. Uh, she's got every, she's gonna see anything I look at, she's gonna see. And it comes with a sense of actually security and peace. And in the moments that I'm weak, I'm like, no, she, she's got that. She's got my location at all times. My kids all have my location. Everywhere I go, they know. I, I try not to travel alone if at all possible. This past week, I went to Birmingham, and she decided last minute that she wasn't going to go on the trip. I had a round table with some pastors. And uh, that night, there were a couple of other guys that were there whose wives weren't there. And so we hung out till about midnight that night together before we went to bed. And I called Lisa in the morning, and the first thing she said is, you were out pretty late last night, weren't you? Because she gets notifications of where I am. And so, so she knows where I'm at, what I'm doing. She was joking with me, giving me a hard time, because she knew, knew what I was doing. But, but it's, it's just pre-deciding. Like, there are going to be moments I don't feel strong. Like, Josh, are you, are, you, are you in that much trouble that you're... No, I actually have a great marriage right now. I actually feel really strong right now, which is why I'm making decisions for the moments that I might not. So where are you vulnerable? What would it look like for you to pre-decide? Corner. Like here, there's some places I, I need help. Some of us, I'm hoping in our small groups, we're going to talk about what does it look like for us to be there for each other, be in each other's corners so we can navigate those corners well. Pre-decide. The last thing, I wish this story ended better, but it, it doesn't. I got to prioritize the presence of God. I got to magnify the cost and got to predetermine my exit. And then I have to trust God with the outcome. I have to trust God with the outcome. How did Joseph get rewarded? He stands firm. I'm not going to. I'm going to run. I'm going to flee from temptation. An angel shows up and says, good job, Joseph. On to your next promotion. No. Prison. False ac accusations. He's on the sex offenders list now, you know, for the rest of his life. He gets falsely accused and he goes to prison. I can't promise you that every time you do the right thing, that good's going to come out of it. Sometimes there's a cost to living for Christ, but we have to be willing to trust God with the outcome. See, Joseph wouldn't have known it, but we know now in hindsight that he had to go to prison. That's where God was going to prepare him for the next assignment on his life. But he lived his life in such a way that God was with him at the top and God was with him at the bottom. If we'll predetermined. You know what, God, I, I, I'm going to prioritize your presence. I want you with me no matter what. Then we're willing to pay the price for doing the right thing. I talked to a guy this week who said, yeah, on a business trip, and I was the only guy that didn't go out to the club. The only guy, it can be isolating sometimes. It can feel lonely. 
Sometimes you're going to miss out on a promotion or opportunities because you decided I'm going to do the right thing. But you know, God is the one who can promote you. God can take you to the places in your destiny so much more than any human boss or earthly person. So we got to, you know, God, I trust you with the outcome. I trust you. And so as we close today, I want us to reflect on what are the areas of vulnerability in your life? We've all got them. Where are you most tempted? You know, I want you to think about that tray that you're carrying. It's God's dreams, God's gifts, God's plan for your life. Let's be a people. Let's be a church that help each other navigate those corners so that we minimize the fallout of those bad decisions. Listen, we're all going to make mistakes, and I hope you hear it. I'm going to say it again. I don't judge you. I love you. God warns us not because he's mad at us, because he, he doesn't want us to ruin our lives. He doesn't want us to experience that kind of pain and that kind of suffering. And so let's do our best to prioritize his presence, magnify the cost, remind each other of what's at stake, predetermine, set some things in motion for us, and we're going to trust God with the outcome. Would you pray with me as we close? God, I thank you so much. Lord, I can think about different people that I've had in my life that because they didn't want to hurt me, they didn't say something. And I thank you, God, that you love us so much that you said something, that you've warned us, that you give us, Lord, corrective words to prevent us from experiencing the hurt and pain that comes with sin. Jesus, I thank you that you took care of our sin on the cross once and for all past, present, and future. I thank you that you walked this earth sinless, that you were the spotless lamb, that you died so that we could be free from our sin. I thank you that there's no condemnation. But God, I pray that a spirit of repentance would come over this place today. Lord, that those of us who we've been dabbling with danger, God, we've been entertaining some of those fantasies in our mind that ultimately lead to death. God, would you... Give us the strength and courage to repent, to turn from our sin, and to run towards you, to experience your love, your goodness, your grace, that we would be overflowing in that, that we would run from the the traps that have been set before us. God, I pray for the people who are in the middle of the mess. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you are an expert at redemption stories that you have a way of turning our messes into your masterpieces. And I pray that you would do that for every person in this room. God, we give you our lives in Jesus' name, amen.